that's all being recorded, isn't it? It is now. You're a piece of shit. Welcome to the podcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how are we referring to each other on this? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Two Guys, One Barracks. I am one of your hosts, Dead Viking Actual, also known as Big Dave, depending on which media platform you follow me on. Joining me today is my dear good friend. How do you want me to re- refer to you? Uh, That's all being recorded, isn't it? It is now. You're a piece of shit. Welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Uh, How are we referring to each other on this? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Two Guys, One Barracks. I am one of your hosts, Dead Viking Actual, also known as Big Dave, depending on which media platform you follow me on. Joining me today is my dear good friend. How do you want me to refer to you? Uh... You can call me Android, uh, or Anemic Android, or Nate. You may recognize Anemic Android uh, from many of my Battlefield uh, streams on Twitch. We're trying to be pumping out more of that content soon, and I would like to thank you all personally for the support on this channel. It means a lot to me. Your continued support fuels me. And uh, today, we had the bright idea that I was going to take over somebody's shift on CQ, which for those of you who are non-military or not in the know, is a 24-hour, basically, watch shift yeah. in a barracks building, uh, basically ensuring that nothing goes wrong. We annotate who comes in and out, any major goings. Uh, and, well, we've been trying to do this podcast for quite some time, and I figured, hey, what if we locked ourselves in a room together for roughly 12 hours? So uh, this is the culmination of that. Yes. Uh, today, we're going to be going over a couple of topics that I find uh, interesting, and then I know uh, a lot of you uh, probably will too. Uh, a lot of you may have uh, started watching my content uh, during the time I was deployed to Syria. I made a lot of D&D uh, content, uh, and D&D has been something that I've actually been practicing for the last eight years uh, as a dungeon master and as a player. Not in equal respects at all. I've been changed to the DM side for a bit until I've met, uh, well, Nate and our good friend Callan, who are amazing DMs. Don't let Nate fool you. I'm uh, dog shit and you can't tell me any different. This is the same thing I say when I DM. We're going to be going over some uh, topics that I believe uh, will be useful to new DMs as well as our insights from personal experience over our last years. How long have you been playing, Nate? Oh, probably off and on for... 10, 12 years. Hell yeah. Taking long breaks in between, but yeah. yeah. I was first introduced to D&D in like middle school and then played a little bit up through high school. Um, a little bit with some buddies back home again and then stopped up until I met Dave in Syria. Yeah, hilarious story, uh, by the way. So I was running a game uh, in Syria. It was once every three days for seven months. And I believe, uh, how many months into the deployment did you show up? Like three months. Three months. So three months in, I'm sitting in a connex, right? Uh, we're doing our job. We're, I- I'm monitoring. I think I was monitoring the radio. At the t- I think I was smoking, but I was on radio guard at the time. And uh, I see this man who I had fully assumed was like a staff sergeant. By the way, he's uh, built in looks. He just he, he looks like a leader, and he is a sergeant now. Congratulations to you. Appreciate that. Man's bursts in, says, hey, where's the fucking nerds at? And I knew in that moment that my time had come because I said, I'm right here. <laughs> uh, we, I think that night smacked a character out for you, and then I, I think it was the day after that we started playing. Yeah, it was... The afternoon after you guys had gotten off shift, because that was also 24-hour duties at yep. the gun pit. Yep, so the afternoon uh, following, uh, he walked his happy ass all the way over to the house that the artillerymen uh, were staying in, and we ran D&D for hours, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think we played anywhere from like four to eight to nine hours at a time every three days for like four months straight. Yep. And I had to run that campaign without no time to plan notes, no time to put uh, plot lines together. 
And uh, this is where my first piece of advice to any aspiring DMs or people who've been DMing for a while but are kind of struggling. I have been DMing for eight fucking years now. You are going to be nervous. You are never going to have your shit together the way you want to. And you will always have to improvise. And that is okay. I have had some of my best campaigns start as one shots, bored with my friends. Uh, the, the one I played recently, uh, or the one I ended recently, rather. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that? I think it was three three months? That specific campaign was four months, but you had been running the overarching big bad and setting for what you said close to two two and a half years close to two years uh it was a it was a really cool campaign uh i didn't tell all my players for two years because i'm a psycho and i was hoping the payoff would be massive and it was i i I had someone pogging at my table silently fucking ellis shout out to you if you're watching this for like 30 minutes uh so overarching uh these two years not even at the ending just at the reveal yeah, so there was still months after it until we got to the ending. Sadly, Ellis PCS, and he's not with us anymore. Yeah, he's just dead. He's gone. Yeah, he died. <laughs> I took him out back and shot him for trying to leave me. Uh, but yeah, so it was two-ish years of uh, the same big bad evil guy uh, and the same kind of overall like multiversal plot, uh, culminating into this quote-unquote campaign, it was a, a two-year campaign that I bricked off into chapters, essentially, uh, where the Big Bad Evil guy revealed that since the fucking beginning, he's been watching the party and toying with them and fucking with them and writing their story for them, blah, blah, blah. It was a, it was an allegory uh, in my head about just, like, toxic DMs who railroad you into playing their story the way they want to. Uh, party lost their fucking minds. Uh, Ellis fucking pog-faced uh, for... A solid 30 minutes, and then we played for three more months, and it had a beautiful ending, uh, one that I will not be sharing, because I feel like the best D&D games are shared with the party, not the public. This is fair. But going into that, I genuinely appreciate that you gave each of us our own story. Well, that's... And the- I think that's a, a very important thing to do as a DM, is you need to make it... You need to find a way to tie your players in to keep playing. It's it's a weird balance of trying to have your overarching plot that you have, whatever that may be, whatever kind of campaign you're running, and then something extra for each of your players to keep them interested. Mm-hmm. And we don't have to spoil it, but I think what you did by giving us our own, every single one of us our own story is important to share because that was very impressive well so that's a philosophy especially for the last like after the reveal for the last like three and a half months that really kicked up well it's um it's a philosophy i have of mine i say it to my players often that uh, it's your guys's story i'm the one writing it and as a dm that is not only the most liberating because hey they're telling the story you don't have to fucking write notes cramming 12 hours panic because oh what are these plot lines going to do they'll tell it for you uh, but it's the funnest for the players, I think personally. Uh, that's why I like homebrewing my games because if I'm if I'm going by a rule book with planned encounters, it doesn't feel natural, it doesn't feel real, and it feels like they're being dragged along on a wire instead of them exploring this world that you created, uh, meeting these characters that you created on their own time in their own way. And there's been so many. I think that's the best times because I have the players be like, "Oh my god, you're a bastard! That was awesome!" And there's times, many times. Whereas the DM, them telling the story like, oh my god, you're a bastard. That was awesome. You know what I mean? Uh, D&D is marketed as a role-playing game. I believe another big problem that DMs have is they put the game aspect way too far into it, right? They get focused on, uh, you know, XP versus milestone. What kind of, what, you know, what, what, what stats do my characters have? How much HP do I give this boss? How much armor class do I give this boss? Uh, how much gold do they find in the loot? Look, D and D intrinsically, even looking at the greats, right? Looking at Brendan Lee Mulligan, looking at um, Matthew Mercer, who is daddy. I love him. Uh, sorry that <laughs> <laughs> cooling my jets. Um, looking at the greats, right? No one cares watching that. Oh, uh, fucking. Uh, uh, Travis's character has a plus six to his strength, plus a plus two to his sword. No, they care 
that Travis had a badass monologue, had a good storyline, and fuck shit up, right? Take the game aspect away from D&D, and what is happening is what humans have been doing since the dawn of time. A bunch of idiots who were bored, sitting around a fire, telling stories together. And yep. that, is, that is the most magical thing you can do. Yep. It's not a game, it's an experience. Agreed. I feel like I'm talking a lot, but this is also that's a podcast, fine. and that's yeah. like the point of the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's also the first one. We'd be all right. Yeah. First, uh, first day jitters, I yeah. suppose. Um, yeah. Uh, that's some of the best advice I can give you starting out. It's their story. You're just narrating it. Yeah. Try to, and then like little parts of the backstory, right? Like um, Ziggy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ziggy was the character that I played for the more important parts of uh, like the final like three and a half months mm. of the, the campaign. After, after, after we have like pre-reveal campaign, that well, was like two and a half years ago, mm. and post-reveal campaign, <laughs> which yeah. was like three months ago. So uh, campaign and then campaign end game, essentially. <laughs> uh, Ziggy, uh, I, was, I was writing the story with, uh, with uh, Android. And I was like, hey man, just type, some, type out what you want the character to be, send it to me, mm-hmm. essentially. I don't think it was in those exact words, right? And uh, he sent me how Ziggy was, uh, you know, part of a tribe. He had a family. His family was uh, taken and or killed by slavers. It was so I can't remember the exact details. Yeah. So uh, Ziggy was part of a Tabaxi tribe that lived in like a jungle area. Um, and these in in his game world, you have these uh, different beings, these crawlers who roamed. Uh, like the deserts that kind of met up with the more jungly area. There was like several like, like a mountain range, so you know climates make sense and whatever. Which is more stuff we can get into, like how to world build. But mm. s- section for another time. Um, Ziggy and a few of his brothers were caught by poachers when they were very young. Yes. Okay. They yes. Were yes. Caught yes, by yes. poachers from the Red Sands. Um, because always your D and D characters have to have the most dark, disgusting backstories. Ziggy was sold into slavery multiple times. He mm. watched his brothers die. Shit was horrible, all the way up until he met the rest of the party at the beginning. Right. The beginning at the end, as it were. Yes, sir. Uh, and I looked at this story and I thought, okay, I'm going to do something uh, that we call in the experience a pro gamer move. <laughs> and I took the idea that he was a. Uh, cub forced into slavery at a young age and I made it to where the themes of his story, because remember, I'm not writing his story, he is, but the overarching themes were the breaking of chains, physical, uh, emotional, spiritual, with his character and becoming his own entity in whatever capacity you ran with and you played that character perfectly. I loved I it the whole time. I Ziggy. I miss Ziggy. I, Ziggy is going to return, hopefully, in another campaign that I run under a different name. Uh... But yeah, it's the idea is like that. Like, say you have a barbarian who's like, oh, I want to be the strongest. I want to, uh, you know, rage and kill everything and be the the you know the top out al- you know the top alpha gamer or whatever the fuck. Make that character's uh, make that character or not don't make but guide that character's story into something like you have this barbarian who wants to be the very strongest. Sure, he's physically strong, but he realizes that the world is not solely reliant on muscle. Let him learn that, like, I am strong through my friends. Like, uh, like fucking, uh, like, uh, Travis's character from... Grog. Grog, right? Like, like, Grog. I get my strength from my friends, right? Or even the idea that, like, yes, this strength is good, but what is the point of this strength if I'm not defending something with it? Take, take an aspect of your character and almost personalize it, personify right. it through their story. Or even, even you can even dig further deeper into that, like, um... Explore themes in your campaign. Set up things of why does he need to be the strongest? Yes. Why does he yes. feel like he has to be the strongest? Mm. For what? For what purpose do you need to be the strongest? Because Ask Ketchum needs to catch them all. Why? Mm. Why does he need to catch them all? Because he's a child with a sense of wonder. Mm. He feels a deep-seated desire to go and explore and find things out and live his curiosity. Mm. He doesn't have to catch them all because... That's the plot, because he's got to catch them all. No, it's because he's a kid who wants to go have an adventure. He wants to go have fun. He wants to go find things out. He's a kid who wants to go be a kid. That's an amazing point. Looking at D&D through the aspect of the DM and through the aspect of the player, do not look at it as a character on a paper. Make it a living, breathing entity and let it grow organically. 
right? You, you see it all the time, right? The, the edgy rogue, my parents died and I was raised by wolves and then my wolf parents died <laughs> and then I was raised by squirrels and then guess what? I had to eat my squirrel parents to survive. <laughs> Why does he chase family? Mm. Why does he need family? Make it a living, breathing thing. Just because the paper is two-dimensional doesn't mean that your world or your characters have to be. And don't be afraid to be your character. There is nothing more fun than getting around with a bunch of your adult homies who could be doing anything the fuck else and pretending like you're a wizard for a yeah. couple hours. That's one of the, another one of our friends. Uh, we'll just call him Nigel. Mm. Nigel eats the bit. Yes. Every yes. time. He's so down for everything. He gets in character so well. And it amazes me mm. that every single time, even if something uh, crazy happens, like he, um, through no fault of his own, either accidentally or on purpose, multiple times, has been like taken over or possessed by another being. And or, he yeah. just rolls yeah. with it. Yeah, or he'll just be like, hey, I want more power. Give it to me and I'll give you something. And then he... Pl- Th- that man takes the bit and runs with it. Oh, yeah. The, a very important thing in improv, which improv is just what D&D is with some math sometimes. It, it's improv, right? Yes, and as a player and as a DM, right? Say you have a character, right? And this is one of my favorite stories. We have a meeting in a brothel with some very, very evil people. And we don't think that we can fight those people on our own. So what do we do? We have the artificer uh, buy a bunch of copper, make a essentially a uh, shape charge coffin out of it, fill it with explosive, and place it under the floorboards of the meeting room. Don't show up to the meeting and detonate the entire fucking brothel. Does that have consequences? Yes, they're terrorists now. <laughs> Did it fucking work? Kid. Did it work? Yes, it worked. Was it funny? Yes. Is that a memory that I will never forget? Yes. The only reason that worked is because I rolled two net 20s in a row. Absolutely, it comes down to the dice. And it, uh, as a DM... Also, this is our friend Upstate, who's uh, sitting with us. Right oh, yeah. Up- Upstate's here I, as well. He... I, we've been recording for 16 fucking minutes. Upstate is also here. Um, <laughs> I tried not to be. I just tried to wait for a point where you're like, fine. I can you're good. introduce myself. Yeah. And that never happened. Let things happen organically. <laughs> um, but yeah, yes and, but it's also okay to yes but. And that is my favorite thing to do as a DM. Because sometimes as a DM, right, you don't want to be toxic about it. But sometimes you just got to get back at your players a little bit. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the players get a much too big chip on their shoulder. Mm-hmm. And you got to tear them down a peg. Yep. Remind them that they're still mortal. Yes, So that, that, and that's another thing. I don't care if you are level 20. You are still a mortal being. Actions have consequences. Life has consequences. Sometimes you need to remind your partner of that. I'm not saying kill your party every time they're being silly. But, uh... Second rem- and third order effects. Yep. You created a shape charge that killed your enemies. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. You're now a wanted terrorist. Yeah. You just burned down somebody else's business Mm. in a major city. And if you have a... Interesting. (laughs) If you have a party that's not swayed by morals, uh, you'll find that in D&D a lot, uh, make it a little more visceral. Say, for instance, that your party is exploring a bunker, and they're taking an elevator over a thousand floors down. Now... There's two party members in the elevator with a very powerful evil entity. Uh, Say a general of some kind of army. This sounds very specific because it is. (laughs) One of your party members makes it to the bottom of the elevator shaft by not using the elevator and thinks, ah, I got this. I'll stop the elevator by uh, detonating uh, the uh, pulley system at the bottom. The elevator breaks, should lock, and they'll be stuck there. Well, seeing as how that is an over 300-year-old bunker with rickety everything, you decide to flip a coin to see if the brakes work or not. Coin lands on tails. Two party members are dead. Plummet so fast, so far, that there isn't even death saves. That's a hard lesson on the reality of your your actions. I do still apologize for that. It's okay. Yeah, stuff like that, right? Don't try to kill your party. But sometimes you don't have to fudge your dice rolls either. Mm. 
It's all about maintaining a perfect natural balance because yeah. no one like like yeah, it's fun to be the overpowered badasses that never lose. But that's the reason I can't watch Dragon Ball. Every time Goku dies, I know he comes back. Yep, and uh, I think that's a good insight into. We are both very similar in how we DM in a way, mm. um, and that might differ from some other people. But we both pretty much have a rule that if it is if it is not specifically said. If your players aren't having like a planning session and one of your players spouts off with something, if you said it, you did it. If you said it, you did it, especially if you say it, you roll. There's no takesies backsies. Mm-mm. If you roll a dice and I didn't call for you to roll a dice, you're living with that outcome. And another thing, right? If you're like, yeah, I want to punch the king in the face, haha, <laughs> roll to hit. <laughs> I didn't mean it. Roll to hit. You narrated. And that cuts out a lot of the side chatter as well because there's only so many times like i want to i want to touch the dragon while it's sleeping and that bitch wakes up and eats the party when they stop touching the dragon while it's sleeping actions have consequences don't make it overbearing but make it real Mm -hmm. yeah you don't have to make it that every single intrusive thought your party has uh you know has overbearing consequences that integrally deplete your story. Mm. But, um, you know, every now and then, remind your party that when they fuck around, they can find out. Do you want, do you want to know a, a funny little secret? Uh, this, this podcast is, is loosening my DM's uh, lockbox of secrets. Do you want to know a funny little thing about the campaign that I've ran for you guys? Go ahead. Those times where shit got super real, super fast, I was, I was taking tally marks on my phone mm-hmm. as to how many times y'all did something stupid that I saved your life on and every time it hit 15 I just let it happen can you give us a hint on what one of those things was uh, the, the elevator because <laughs> I was like yeah yeah that'll work and then I was like well it's been 15 times they've done something fucking stupid we'll flip a coin for it and something like that can make it feel re- like if you're having a hard time. I was like, oh, when when do I drop the hammer as a DM versus when do I let them rule of cool it? Put a random number generator on. Mm-hmm. Let it hit that number. It's fun. It's natural. It's random. And another thing, right? DMs burn out constantly trying to balance all of this shit. Make it random and fun for you too. You're still a member of the game. You're, you're not. You're not a TV screen handing out fucking. Like instructions, you're not a video game. Make it random and fun for you. Yeah. And as a DM, given to some of those times, it's like it'd be really fucking funny if this happened, right? You got to keep yourself entertained. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. Uh, I do something very similar, but I don't usually do. Uh, I don't do the tally marks. Mm. What I do is I actually do make it random. Okay. Um, I steal something from. Uh, by the way, stealing things as a DM is the best way to get new things. Uh, especially if you're like super into D and D. I'll also tell you there are maybe three original stories that were ever written on Earth. And everything else has been a copy of it. Yep. Uh, I have all of my party right now when I'm running. When they enter the main setting, the city. I've been wondering what these roles are for. Hold on. Am I about to learn something? So I'm not going to give away the very specifics. Okay. But there is a number system, right? Okay. Whenever we enter the city, I ask two questions. I say, everybody roll me a D6. And are we moving stealthily? Mm. If they're not moving stealthily, then fuck it. It's out the window. The DC gets harder. Mm. Um, but I have every person in my party roll a d6, and it is a group roll. And depending on the additions of all of those rolls, interesting. Okay. Um, something bad will happen, something neutral will happen, or something good will happen. I don't remember. And, and I don't that, remember anything good happening yet. What about something mean? Something green? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're gonna get into that in a we're second. We're gonna get into that because I feel like that was that was lightning in a bottle that I pulled out of that- my ass. That yeah. fully was lightning in a bottle. But that that is that is something that when we get into the importance of improv, mm-hmm. that is a fucking highlight. That as as a player, yep. as a player in my entire time DMing, that was the that was one of the funnest things I've ever I've ever yeah. fucking had happen. Even though your character was fighting for the. Oh yeah, no. E- even though I ended that encounter on like I think three HP <laughs> and probably some uh, mental scars and trauma for that character that'll never go away. It was so fun to play. <laughs> Let's just get into it. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? We'll let it flow, flow naturally. Flow naturally. Uh, the impor- What was it? The importance of... Improv. Improv, yes. Uh, and again, I think that's very much how you and I are as DMs. Um, you come up with everything 
off the cuff. I usually come in for at least the first what I feel like is going to be half an hour with some notes. Mm. Um, or I'll get a f- I'll, I'll play and I'll make it mellow for the first like half an hour to see how the night is feeling, mm-hmm. and then I'll just go off the vibe of the party and just match energy. Hell yeah! Right? Um, if the party's feeling like fucking around and finding out, fine, we'll fuck around and find out. Go ahead. Man, if the party's our- feeling like moving the story forward more, then we'll move the story forward more. So what I'm saying is our characters need to just talk constantly in the first thirty minutes about how they don't feel strong enough, and we'll start leveling up. <laughs> <laughs> No. Um, okay. You know what? I, 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 as a DM who's been asked that question, I just had to try. Coming into this, like I said, so I, I have mapped out. A, so I, I'm running my campaign off of a pre-made setting from one of the, I'll let it out, from what a YouTuber that I watch, YouTubers. Um, and my campaign that I'm running right now is based on their setting. I'm not using all of the rules. I'm not using their entire book that they made for it. I'm just running their setting, and I'm letting my players tell their story the way I see fit to write it. Mm. Right? It's your story. I'm just telling it. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's kind of the big takeaway. But the importance of improv. Let's get back on track. I apologize. Um, oh no, I, I dear viewers, this is going to happen constantly. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know where I was going with this. The importance, the importance of improv. of improv, something means something green, a spleen and a lima bean. Oh, yes. Yes, something means something green, a spleen and a lima bean. Um, so I usually have notes. This is one of those times where I went in completely blind to a session, and I didn't have notes. And they, it was also one of the nights where they wanted to fuck around and find out. Yeah. They came, in, they came into this session wanting to make moves. So I let them make some moves. They found a specific NPC they were looking for. Um, who is a, a trickster, real shoddy, you know, uh, backdoor dealer kind of guy. Uh-huh. Um, and he took them to exactly where they wanted to go. But he did it in his own way. And he locked them in this, uh, this gauntlet, as it were. He let them follow them all the way to the hideout. He led them directly to where they wanted to go. And then they played his game. Because he just let it all happen. And they didn't ask any more questions. Because <laughs> they got what they wanted. And that's okay. Let them into a little bit of a false sense of security and then pulled the rug out from underneath them. And I didn't have anything planned because I did not expect them to find him this quickly. But they really wanted to. So I just let it ride. Sure. We wrote some random encounters. They they did well. This was one of the good times. Because <laughs> we had like, what, there were like six of us or five of us at that time. Uh-huh. Three of you rolled sixes. One of you rolled a four. One of you rolled a five. Cool, something amazing is about to happen. So you found who you were looking for. Why not? Um, I had not planned for this at all, this gauntlet whatsoever. So I just started trying to find out some things that would rhyme so I could make a random encounter in this place. Mm -hmm. And I came up (laughs) with something green, something mean, a spleen, and a lima bean. (laughs) And two of my players... I was one of them. ...went through two separate doors. I made uh, an encounter of which... It was kind of like um, Schrodinger's cat, right? Where mm. you open one door and nothing happens unless the other door is closed, right? Like like hidden hidden spaces, spaces that you don't see unless specific conditions are met, right? Right. Like if you leave the cat in the box, you don't know if the cat's dead or not. You don't know if the cat's there or not until you open the box. Until you open the box in the right way, you don't get into the room. Right. Two of my players ended up taking one step into the room. Two of my players ended up taking the step into a different room. And I want you to know right now, I made the wrong fucking choice. <laughs> we'll get into that. Um, yeah, I had two of my players essentially in the control room. Controlling the encounters that the other two players were in. And Thieves Can't written on the walls was something mean, something green, a spleen, and a lima bean. And when they touched one of the walls something would happen to my other players. They ended up touching a lima bean first. Uh, Dear fucking God, I remember it like it was yesterday. uh, I don't know why, but like, what are the Russian dolls called? Matryoshka Matryoshka dolls dolls happened in my mind, and I was like, that'd be hilarious. So I had a reverse... uh, Matryoshka dolls? Matryoshka dolls. I had a reverse Matryoshka doll. Russian nesting dolls. Russian nesting dolls, yeah. 
Wow, little nesting. Russian nesting dolls. What the fuck is nesting? <laughs> Russian nesting dolls. Google nesking right now and tell me in the comments what you find. I'll uh, do it right now, actually. A little bit of a reverse Russian nesting doll scenario. I had eight lima beans with toothpicks for weapons. Um, spawn in the room. Mind you, I'd like to butt in right now. My character was a level three uh, damn fear <laughs> fighter, right? I don't have to breathe. I can heal off of bite attacks. I have heavy armor, good sword, good shield. I'm feeling invincible because there's fucking three stupid fucking lima beans eight. sitting. Eight, eight stupid fucking lima beans sitting in front of me. Every single time they killed one of the lima beans, all of the other lima beans got stronger. So, Which wasn't concerning until, at first. Up until the point where they got to like the last three lima beans and they were very much so equally as strong as the, the two players who were fighting them. I got stabbed in the chest with a toothpick for ten damage. Mind you, Nigel wasn't getting hit, I don't think. <laughs> no. I took, mo I took all of those hits. <laughs> I went from like 30 health to 29 health to 25 health to 10 health. And this is the first fucking puzzle in this dungeon. I tried to bite attack poison, which I'm immune to as a damn fear. And then the acid damage hit. <laughs> so, I think I walked out of the lima bean encounter with like 5 HP. I'm not yeah. going to cap to you. What was next? So, uh, you, I hate to green, mention something that green. I happened to be hallucinating during all this, using my sword as a assault rifle with a torch strapped to the front as a flashlight, which... Was toggleable by a switch that nobody but me could find. Yes. Second surprise guest, by the way, Nigel's also here. There, there's wasn't there also a bayonet on that thing as yeah, well? So yeah, so Nigel had taken, house. like, some hallucinogens or something. Or no, it was, uh, you had, like, OD'd on... There was a... What, what, no, I took one of the lima beans. That was yeah, no, no, you fully ate, ate one of the lima beans, <laughs> and he started hallucinating. Uh, holding a long sword, he thought it was a rifle. He put a, he put a torch on it that he could auto click on and off like a like a flashlight, um, and then he put a dagger on his long sword, connecting a bayonet to his rifle essentially, as he's having horrid hallucinations while fighting these things. I also want and to say, the, the, and, 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 I'm sorry, but on, I really on, want to say on. this because uh, nesking. Uh, Informal kissing, caressing, and other sexual activity between partners that does not involve stimulation of the generals or sexual intercourse. Okay, Russian nesting dolls. All right, moving on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I want I want you all to know right now that while uh, Nigel is, has, is having this goofy hallucination where he's uh, in platoon the movie, I'm getting jumped <laughs> as the general of a foreign country, bred and born to be the perfect killing machine. Almost to death by lima beans. <laughs> and that was the was first encounter. And that was the first encounter. I was slaughtering the lima beans. Uh, what was next? Something green? Green. What was something green? So, a bunch of, uh, they, uh, yeah, they chose something green, and a table full of broccoli appeared in front of us. <laughs> That's right. <the laughs> and, and I made them eat their vegetables. <laughs> and the problem is, two things. One, vegetables are icky, and I will not eat them in real life. That's second, why I made you do it, Dick. Second of all, as we ate the, the, the broccoli, more broccoli started appearing on the table. Mm hmm. And it took until we both vomited to pass that. Yep. Thank God I didn't take damage from that one. It gets better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next was a spleen. Yep, there it goes. They, <laughs> hit, they hit the A spleen button and trap doors. Dropped the entire room that the other two were in uh, onto a wooden stakes. A wooden, yeah, yeah, a wooden stake onto pit. like a wooden stake death trap. Yeah, punchy. Uh, Nigel you. made his save DC and Dave did not. Mind and you, he was stabbed in the spleen. Wooden stakes, one of the few things that my character would not have been able to heal from, <laughs> dropped me from five HP to one HP. <laughs> On the third encounter. <laughs> I sound angry. It was the most brilliant fucking thing I've ever seen. It's just, I'm salty that you didn't get hit once, Nigel. Damn, that's crazy. Maybe if you had a Vietnam flashback, you would also <laughs> Maybe if you just had a tactical assault long sword with a bayonet, you would have been fine. Also, the torch was a flamethrower at one point. I'm really yes. Yeah. Yes, it was. And, and they ask me why when I DM, I'm really mean to them. I'm not I've mean to you all. I've never asked you that. Um, I have never asked you that, Dave, because I know why. And the last thing being something, something mean, because they thought that was going to be the worst, but it ended up being the most hilarious. <laughs> Dave, fully deliriously mad, 
annoyed at me for playing the way that this was going out. <laughs> Mad that his character was getting shit on. Um, something mean was a sphinx that started off telling ridder- that started off telling riddles, and then it started making like snide comments and bitchy remarks, and then it just started roasting both of them. And mind you, right? I I like to think of myself as a level-headed player, but the whole time. Watching everyone like giggle and laugh at Nigel hallucinating in character while I'm getting waffle stomped down the drain made me so angry. I stood up out of my chair, put my finger in Nate's face, and started degrading him as the Sphinx. <laughs> and then, and then I played off the bit where I, he, like, like yeah, the, this general's like degrading the Sphinx, and there's like slipping things about himself in there. You know, he's feeling vulnerable. He doesn't feel like hot shit right now. The general's getting waffle stomped by furniture and legumes, right? So just fully melted down. I started tearing up in real life he from did. the energy. It was, it was. So fucking good. It was so good. And that's how they beat the last encounter because they out bitchied and out meaned something mean. And that was the encounter that I pulled out of my ass. And all of that that we just described over the last nine minutes took about an hour 20. Yep, it was an hour 20 of a carnival from hell improv session that I fully thought was written out. I thought that there's no fucking way that he pulled that out of his ass. And let me tell you something. You might not know what you're doing as a DM. Neither do your players. Lean into it. Yeah. Lean yeah. fucking into it. I can get some in on this as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing from the Electron. The thing from the Electron was hilarious. Uh, because fully, y'all were never supposed to actually like see that thing face to face. That was always supposed to just be like background and you know kill off an npc or two to make you guys you know just be like oh, okay yeah this thing can just yeah so for, for context we're playing uh, a game that uh upstate upstate was running uh it was a sci-fi fan as a, as a sci-fi game which y'all are getting to play tomorrow as well uh it was a sci-fi game we had we're investigating this uh this old lost scientific research ship uh, that had, uh, through uh, means beyond the comprehension of a bunch of... We were, we were playing, like, regular enlisted soldiers, by the way. We had no idea what the fuck was happening. This extra-dimensional demon being started hunting us down. And we said, fuck that. We have $8.5 billion in taxpayer <laughs> equipment. We're just going to shoot it till it stops moving. <laughs> and it worked. Because <laughs> I didn't think of... St- I didn't give this thing stats. Mm. So I'm like, yeah, this is just, again, you know, this is supposed to be, like, a background thing to, like, put fear into you and, like, make you, like, that much like, more... Like, sp- like the alien from the original Alien yes, game? exactly. You're not it's supposed a- to kill it. It's just supposed to scare you while you run. Mm. Yes. It's supposed to be a motivator to keep moving. Yes, exactly. It's just exactly like the fucking Xenomorph. And then we said we have 60 pounds of <laughs> yeah, military-grade equipment that, that says had, no. Like, <laughs> yeah, and then they realized that they had, like... Anti-tank guided missiles, which, by the way, I'm removing that weapon from the game. Coward. <laughs> Granted, it was with Ellis, so he's gone now as well. That's yeah, that's fair enough. Right. So my character's personal kit. I had this th- man had a KS-23. I had a KS-23 loaded with slugs and dragon's breath, three fragmentation grenades, four pounds of C4. I had a door breaching kit. All this crazy shit. Yeah, and I said all of this taxpayer money can just get raised again. Yeah, they really just <laughs> stopped running. There's no such thing as budget cuts for the military industrial complex. Yeah, they, <laughs> just, they stopped We'll just run- cut funding for schools again. <laughs> yeah, they stopped running, turned around and went, what if we can put the GDP of a large nation worth of ammunition into this thing? And I'm like, great, now I have to make stats for this thing. And I had to keep buffing this thing's HP because y'all kept rolling like 18 damage per roll. I was just like, okay then. And this is where I give you a good piece of advice. And a piece of advice that has fucked over my party a couple times. And y'all didn't even complete the main thing on this shit. No, no, we let the scientists take care of that. I was playing a demoted corporal Mm -hmm. with an alcohol addiction and nicotine addiction who is the breach man because he fucked up throwing a flashbang through a door. Who is he, me? Yeah, yes. yeah, I know, essentially. <laughs> uh, me if I was infantry, right? It was, I don't it, give a... I don't, Dave, if he was you. This character did not give a flying fuck about star charge, how fucking hyperspace works. He wants to get in, put his hours in, go home, beat off to some fucking porn, smoke a Marlboro goddamn red, and go to bed. Jesus 
And that's exactly what fucking happened after yep. I after I killed the space demon. Yeah. And that's why. That's another I'm thing sorry, of no. why. It's me, it's me too, though. That's <laughs> another thing of why uh, pulling your characters into the plot is so important. Right. You have to tie them to the plot somehow. Like before I started my campaign, I gave each and every one of you a mission. Mm. Every single one of you had a reason to go to the city. Whether it was to work together or not, every single one of you needed to get into the city, so why not get into the city together? Right? Just dip into fucking <laughs> fade away. <laughs> Funny thing about that is uh, my character's motivation led uh, me to world building an entire empire yeah. in his world. Why not? A whole military, whole fucking industri- a whole like industrial complex, mm-hmm. whole fucking political scale. Uh, we end up like doing troop movements into this fucking uh, country to provide yeah. humanitarian aid, to provide a military stronghold for my people. And that character... Oh, I can't wait for the next session. Dude, I'm hyped for when it. When you guys uh, storm the castle, as it were. Yeah, and it's like if, yeah, like, if I hadn't been tied personally into that, I wouldn't have had my military background pull like 50 troops to help us storm a temple. We would have had to sneak in there by ourselves and get eaten alive by something, probably. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Now I get to do something I've never done before, which is like a large scale battle. Large scale battles are fun. Huge scale battle. Uh, like sieges are fun too for DD. Yeah, sieges gonna, are like, fun. Like this, this place that they're going into is a uh, essentially like. So the, the city got destroyed, right? It's been run over by monsters forever. There's some magical uh, fuckiness going on in the city. And they need to get into like a stronghold of gnolls, essentially, right? A stronghold of. Um, what are essentially like coyote werewolves. Oh, no, Tharp. All of my followers are gay and nerds. They, they know what gnolls are. I yeah. guarantee it. Yeah. Especially because, uh, you know, I'm going to take a quick uh, quick side tangent here. Uh, I have recently had um, se- I've recently had several hundred people follow me recently that are all from the furry community. I appreciate y'all's support. I don't know what I did to... Get on your For You page, but thanks for coming around, and welcome to the Dead Viking family. Mm -hmm. I'm interested as to what in my military TikToks uh, drew everyone. I'm going to keep it real, Dave. As one of them. (laughs) (laughs) You give off the vibe that a lot of those, like, fursuiting YouTubers and VTubers do just without the suit. That's fair enough. You give I don't, off like that similar vibe and energy. Uh, so like, it's just like they're just like, oh, okay, I'll give this a shot. Oh, he's just like X, Y, Z, whoever I watch. So. And I want everyone to know that the only reason I don't have a suit for the memes is because I'm poor. What? How much money are you willing to? <laughs> None. Get? I'm poor. <laughs> Oh, who said you'd be paying for it? I'm not letting someone buy moving me. Moving on. Or, moving on. Moving video. on. Move, moving on. Uh, I appreciate all the support. Thank you guys for showing up. Don't know where the fuck you guys came from, but uh, welcome. You're mine now. Deepest You're not going anywhere. Hell, that's where they came from. I believe it. Yeah. Knowing, knowing my large comment, scale it. battle, uh, which I would have had to try to find some way for them to sneak in, but now they get to fight. You know, a couple of big bosses that are in there. That'll be fun. Mm. Um, they get to command troops as well. You're yes. a general. You're going to be commanding troops. Yes. That is going to be a fun interaction to have. That's going to be fucking great. I'm excited to do. I'm excited to play that role. Yes. <laughs> I'm very excited to play that role. We're playing D and D Starcraft wait. now. Yeah. Boy, I can't wait to play fucking Dungeons and Dragons Hearts of Iron Four Edition. Yeah. It's going to be a great time. Uh. I just spaced hard. My bad. I disassociated for a second. What are we talking about? We're talking about the we're talking about the siege of the temple. But what, what was the main point we were trying to get to? The importance of improv. Are we still on that? Yes, and I'm gonna be real. I need to be backfilled on uh, what we're talking about because what I'm tracking in that campaign is well. Let's do let's do this. Let's pivot into one of the other ones since we're talking about large scale battles. Excellent. How to run an effective combat encounter. So, here's the way that I do it. I'm not saying that this is the right way to do it. Uh, First of all, much like Sun Tzu knowing thy enemy, you need to know your party. 
the point of a good combat encounter isn't to kill your party, and it isn't to have your party wax your fucking bad guys immediately. You need to look at them and what they can do, their strengths and their weaknesses, and make a challenging encounter. The point of combat as a DM is not to slaughter your party. The point is to make the fight challenging enough that a couple might drop. Keep the stakes high. Uh, for instance, uh, when my party was going absolutely fucking sicko mode, uh, to the point where like they were just melting most of my bosses, uh, I started not giving them HP. I started, mm -hmm. yeah, no, don't, if, if you can't balance a fight, don't give your uh, boss HP. Do what you have to do to make the fight feel desperate, but don't make it unwinnable. Also, there's nothing wrong with mixing up one big tanky thing and a bunch of fucking minions. I mean, that's kind of combat 101, right? If your party's really good at munching a bunch of small shit, throw a big shit in there. If they're really good at fighting just a big shit, throw a swarm of small stuff in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, fight, fight intelligently as a DM. They're not just mindless fucking NPCs, right? Say uh, we're, uh, we're fighting a powerful ally who is commanding drones, essentially. Have their drones harass the spellcasters so that they can't focus that massive damage on the BBEG. The spellcasters are squishy. They're in danger. The fighters are going to turn their fucking pressure into protecting the spellcasters. The fight seems desperate. Because holy fuck, if those spellcasters go down, who's going to cast Revivify? If your bosses are hurt, not every boss is a martyr. Not every boss is a, a suicidal, I'll win or I'll die. Have them retreat, grow stronger, fight them again. Hmm? Or if the party's been slugging through it and you need them to take a win, have them fight a bunch of zombies who will just keep walking forward and getting mulched because your players need to feel badass too. They might not be the fucking Goku of this world, right? But they're still heroes. Heroes need challenges. Heroes also need wins. It's a balancing act. And to be honest with you, that balance only gets perfect if you practice. Don't be afraid to kill a couple of your party members. Don't actively try. If I wanted to play Dark Souls, I'd play Dark Souls. I'm here to fight an insurmountable battle with my friends and come out on top sometimes. That's how I run combat. Yeah. Also, give your people counter spell. If you're tired of your casters, give them a couple counter spells. I want to cast fireball. No. <laughs> the, or uh, I've had a couple bosses that are immune to magic. Yeah. That's fun. Mm -hmm. That's real fun. Your magical plus two swords is just a sword. Or give them tastes of bosses that can't die yet. Yes. Fuck yes. That I is my gave, favorite shit. I give my party uh, a taste of a, of a what will be a reoccurring boss the other day where they fought a, a zombie T-Rex. Oh, yes. That, so because of the circumstances of this world, and we'll go into this like taking away different conditions just to mix things up, right? Mm. There is a thing in this world that I, I don't want to get. For you horrible people, I don't know you personally. You can be a psychopath, but you know what? Stay on that. You I mean, there's you. there's something wrong with you if you follow me, but I love you anyway. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But yeah, um, make a make a boss, right? Make a boss that you can't kill, right? Make a boss that maybe you can kill, but with a specific fucking item that the party has no idea exists yet. Oh. Uh, let's see, what's a good example of this? Oh, um, I had a encounter, I don't believe it was with your party, where uh, it, was, it was very Resident Evil, right? They had a nemesis-style boss that would hunt them down, and this guy was immune, and they were getting frustrated, right? And I was like, well, have you guys researched this thing yet as a party? did some digging, and it turns out that it took a certain uh, nuclear isotope to kill this thing. Only place to get that was, conveniently for me, at a spot that would progress the story a little bit. Uh, and so they had to find this fucking, like, depleted fucking bullshit tonium uh, bullet. They only had one to kill this thing with. And that was fun, because they then they fully understood, oh god, this thing's gonna keep coming until we get that. We have to go get it, right? Uh... Don't allow combat to get repetitive, and don't let the party get comfortable in combat. Mm -hmm. Combat is something that should be scary every time for different reasons. Yep. And it doesn't always have to be the enemies that are different. You can change certain things. Like parts of the world that I'm in, or that I'm running right now, take away their healing. Yes. Right? 
like parts of there's like regular mist and there's like stronger mist and part of it when you're in the the regular mist is you cannot long rest you do not get certain abilities back sure you can pop a potion you could take a short rest that also comes with consequences because you're short resting and poisonous mist right yeah you can do it you can get some health back but if you're having encounter after encounter you're not doing anything to your enemies different you're just making it hardy for the party to harder for the party. <laughs> <laughs> you're making it hardy for the party to do what they're good at and what they yep. know they're good at and that's sub what is it subversing expectations. subverting expectations Subver, yeah subverting expectations in a different way or uh, one simple mechanic change everything another great example is there's a boss what fight what are you going to do when you can't take a nap yep. after this next encounter another great example this is there's is a there's a boss fight that my players got into where every attack would subtract from their active health and their maximum health. Yeah, that one was, uh, that was actually, I will say that was very fun. Uh, I'm glad you think terrifying so. Terrifying mechanic, and it came with the added consequence of uh, there was no point in having a healer anymore. Because yeah. you're always at max health. Exactly it, right? Say you have two health left, but your max health is two. What the fuck are you going to do now? The idea of having uh, stakes, change the stakes, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a fight that the party knows they can win, but someone else important's on the line. Oh, yeah. For example, say you have a party member hostage. One of the characters has a sword. Uh, one of the enemies has a sword to that character's neck. <laughs> oh, yay! My trauma. If this fight goes bad for the bad guys, that hostage gets his neck sliced. Consequences: stakes. Keep them high. Keep them scary, but reward the players well for. Finishing the encounter either way, right? Have you gone over that story? I'm I have not gone over that story. Would you like to go over that story, Nigel? Oh, oh yeah, because I was indirectly the cause of that death. Oh, it turns out uh, you had overpowered my character a bit. Oh, what was his name? Was that Oswald? Yes, that was that Oswald. That was Oswald. Fallen Asmar. Uh, we were in the middle of combat. One of our party members had been turned. That would have been... Uh, Ziggy. It was, right? it, yeah, it, was, it, was, it was Ziggy that was turned. Ziggy was turned, and he was, uh, he was beefed. He was uh, doing a lot of heavy damage to us. And uh, I had also been beefed, because in that campaign I had made some dark deals with some people that I probably shouldn't have. And uh, it made me into a powerhouse fighting kind of Ziggy as a powerhouse, but I couldn't kill Ziggy, and I realized that. But Ziggy wasn't even the big bad evil guy. There was a, uh, what was he, an angel, archangel? He was, a, he was an angel of death yeah, who was enacting was... penitence on the party. And we ended up... Uh, Trying to kill Ziggy, uh, not going well. Our party members getting dragged into this just pure black mist, unrelated to the other mist from earlier. A lot of mist happening around here. <laughs> yeah, kind of weird. But... Like I said, there's only three original stories. Everything else is a copy of it. Yeah. And that's okay. Run uh, your Star Wars game if you want to. Who fucking cares? After we'd lost, I think, like three party members to the mist, and we technically didn't know what was happening to them, I decided to use the fancy shotgun I was given with this, uh, I believe it was the buckshot, which you had really made too overpowered because I was a uh, blood hunter with a what is it that gives me the like a bonus action one handed sh uh, grit grit points or whatever Cro as a, cro as a yeah. firearms expert it, it, yeah it was something like that but it gave me like the ability to like double shot on a bonus action with a one handed like crossbow but we had modified that shotgun and uh, it was crazy I ended up uh, nuking the BBEG uh, and two turns with two nat 20s back to back totaling close to like 600 damage yep something like that in a singular turn uh, melting the character into a puddle of nothing which was really good because uh, BBEG and his party with Ziggy were uh, absolutely fucking smashing us it was, it was going to be almost a complete total loss if we didn't do that but uh, the issue was is that our good friend Gabriel who we had tied to a uh, wonderful cross with a sword to his throat uh, well, he still had that sword to his throat, and after nuking BBEG, uh, the angel with the sword just tore his soul asunder. Ripped that mm. shit right in two. Uh, probably could have made some better plays, but it made the, the stakes were high, and my mistake was not doing something about him prior to dealing with uh, the BBEG. And it was one of the most fun encounters I think I've ever had. Oh, yeah. Remember, desperation in a fight works both ways. Yeah. 
The most dangerous beast is the one that's cornered. If the enemies are getting cornered, yeah, like Ziggy was out for blood for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this I was being like fully mind controlled. I had had all of my free will taken away from me, and that's one of the points where, if your players are down for it, because obviously it's their story, somebody's just got to be down for the bit mm -hmm. at some point. And if you're down for the bit, and they're down for it too, roll with it. Mm -hmm. This is something that. Nigel is exceedingly good at with one of the most chilling lines that I've ever heard in yes we are hungry oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, that was such a no fucking fucking dapper give me a hug off that one that one was fucking awesome yeah no that was right at so the uh the guy who I made the deal with to make myself a big old bad beefcake happened right at the beginning of that combat at where this line came from uh mm. which again right sorry to interrupt yeah, you're good. It's, it's for the character, right? Yeah. Absolutely. You are up against something that you know is way stronger than you. Something else is offering help. Yeah, just monumental power at the cost right. of something. Your character was already, like, emotionally broken oh. in a vulnerable state, and something's offering him a way out. And so why good. not take it? Mm-hmm. And uh, by taking it, I also kind of had my own mind taken over, but not in an entire sense. More so, it was assimilated into another, a hive mind, which we all think the same, and we became very hungry. I became hungry, and when I was asked what I needed to do in that moment by the being I had just accepted this dark back from, I only mentioned that, well, yes, we are hungry, and we are going to go feed. And it was so natural, because I, th I think what happened was out of character, he's like, so how do, how do I feel? And I said, we feel pretty hungry. He said, yes, we are hungry. And I got chills down my spine as the DM. I was like, yes! It's, oh my god, it's happening! It's finally happening! Yeah, that was a good point. Yeah. Oh god. And that was, uh... I'm trying to remember what happened after that point in the story. Was that when we went to the mountain? Or was that with a completely... You guys were already at the mountain. The mountain, the mountain is where the plague happened. Where all of the firstborn sons died, and then all of the villagers died. Yeah, 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 no, I'm talking... I'm trying to remember... It was like the original breakout the point of... The bag is where I'm trying to... No, way something. before. That was way before Yeah, that was way before. Bag, I'm yeah. trying to remember what happened right after that combat. What happened right after that combat is... Uh, oh, it was a while ago. Uh, I believe what happened after that combat is... Uh, you guys realize that, like, oh, fuck, we're working with the biggest BBEG. Well, that's cool. Uh, yeah, we that's need to... I, I think the party's like, we are not powerful enough to fight what is at bay. We need to get more powerful. Then went out exploring for... Um, Ways to get stronger, and then by proxy, led to the rest of the story. Mm. It was a lot of you guys kind of just wandering lost, looking for any way to hopefully be strong enough to fight the next godly event that happens to you all. Because once again, we kept fucking around. Yep. So we kept finding out. Yep. And it just snowballed. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we need to get stronger to fight this thing, oh no, it turned on us. Now we need to get stronger to fight this thing. Mm -hmm. The campaign took so many turns, I'm just trying to remember. Because that campaign is a very good example of multiple different ways to DM very well. Because you may not, uh, may not like to hear it from us, but uh, you took that campaign and you didn't just like do the same, like as you said, you didn't repeat the same stuff over and over, but you also didn't repeat your same uniqueness over and over. Yeah. It was always a constant new unique, because there's always like those unique tropes that you can throw in. It's like, oh, that's cool, we haven't done that in a campaign before, but it's also kind of predictable. Mm. You always kept us on our toes. And doing that throughout the entirety of that long-ass campaign had to have been a nightmare. Considering the week-long breaks you would take at times, it made sense. No, it, um, and that's another thing, right? Do not be afraid to ask for time with your party. Yes, we all want to hang out and play D&D. &D. We also don't need the DM to be brain fried because week after week he only has five days to plan out a three-month campaign, you know? Yeah. Writing takes time and that's okay. I need you guys, I very much need you guys if you guys have been, if you guys have been uh, slowly <laughs> rotating a cow in your head while you listen to this, snap, snap into attention, jingle the keys. It is okay as a DM to take breaks for yourself. Look, there's no reason for you to make fun of my constant mental state. <laughs> Listen, man. You're not even a DM yet. Just wait. Wait until the cow is rotating and your party asks you shit. Yeah. Because <laughs> I even feel it after DMing for like... 
five weeks in a row, mm-hmm. a month in a row, which I think is what it's out. It was about a month or, or five weeks in a row that I read Ben DMing straight. Give or take. And, like, I understand earlier in the podcast we said that Dave would, you know, DM every three days for hours at a time. That's when we were, you know, <clears throat> deployed with not much else to do and a lot more free time and not worrying about home and not yep. worrying about work. You go to work, you do your thing. When you're on your work rest cycle, when you rest, you rest. Mm. When you're working, you're working. Here, you know, balancing everything else that comes with life and trying to plan like that, you can burn out very easily. And remember, D and D day is a sacred day to unwind, relax, and have fun. At least it is for us. I, well, That's how we view it. It is right. the day when we all get together yeah. and it's Shadow Wizard Money Gang time. And I believe that's what everyone wants it to be, at least, right? <clears throat> Please, for the sake of your career as a DM, don't fall into the same trap that I did in the beginning, where D&D feels more like work than work. Yeah. Let it flow naturally. You'll make your mistakes as a DM, and that's okay. I feel like I'm fucking up constantly, and I've been doing this for years, dude. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let it flow naturally. Imposter syndrome upon us. Yeah. <laughs> Let it flow naturally. Let the party tell their own story throughout it, right? And just have fun. I could not do however long we've been recording telling you about how to uh, set up XP, how to set up milestones, how to min-max a character. I can only tell you how to tell a compelling story. Oh, I can tell you how to min-max the shit out of a character. Yeah, I know. It's so ingrained in me that I do it without meaning to. If that makes sense. Not in, like, a game-breaking way that I, like, mean to do it to, like, be a dick at the table. Yeah. But, like, I choose things for my plot relevance that also look good on a character sheet. Mm-hmm. Like, a well-built character alone, just by stats, will take you very far. Oh, yeah. And also remember, right? DMs of the world. Your party's never invincible. Never. Never. Yeah, you have this paladin who wears plus four heavy plate armor, has an AC of 30, and can pass any strength, charisma, or dex, or, or uh, intelligence check. Make that fucker roll a dex check and watch him sweat. That's always fun. Or you have a wizard, right? Yeah, uh, I remember I was playing in a campaign back in my home in Spokane, Congratulations. Washington. Congratulations. The enemy uh, caster just counterspelled one of your dudes, and the next round cast heat metal on the dude with heavy plate armor, yep. and he couldn't make that wisdom save. Or not even that. Uh, there was a wizard and a barbarian who thought that they were the dynamic duo because they played off each other's strengths. Well, I loved that. They split up for a minute. Both got kidnapped. The wizard was placed in a room with iron bars that was slowly filling up with water, and the barbarian had to do the worst thing a barbarian ever could. I pulled up riddles for five-year-olds and had this fucker stumped, right? <laughs> Dude, yeah. riddles in a D&D game will fucking destroy your players like nothing. I have the most simple traps ever in some of my D&D games, and it will leave people stumped for hours. I feel the soul leave my eyes as soon as I have to figure out a, a simple riddle, right? But it was super simple. Two of the iron bars were loose in the wizard's trap. And one of the puzzles was written in a language that the wizard knew that would have instantly let him out without having to do all the other uh, puzzles and stuff. And they learned very quickly that they were not... And mind you, this was a bit of an extreme punishment. These two players were problematic at the table. I'm talking main character syndrome. I'm talking uh, yeah. always tried to weasel me into doing what they wanted. Like they, they, they didn't play at the table for very long. And they realized that while you are smart, you might not be strong. And while you are strong, you might not be smart. Teamwork is perfect. The wizard drowned and the barbarian starved to death. Because they could not leave those traps without each other. And they, they learned that, oh, while me and my older brother work well together, it would have been nice to have the rest of the party here too, kind of thing. Mm. Guide them to work together. Don't railroad them. Unless they're, like, the worst players you've had at the table. I'm not going to drop names, but I'm thinking of two very specific people from my my old home group. Uh, and then, yeah, you can you can teach people a lesson if they're being dickheads. Because at the same time, this is everyone's space. Everyone deserves to be respected. If there's an outlier, right. 
talk to him if talking doesn't work, kill his character slowly in front of him over the course of two hours. Basically what we're saying is treat your treat your characters treat your characters like you're training a puppy. <laughs> Reward the behaviors that you like to see and that everybody's enjoying at the table and not punish until it becomes problematic, but nudge them away from problematic characteristics. So, and you can do that in many interesting and fun ways. One of them being, obviously, right, like you just mentioned, two problematic characters causing trouble for not just the other and uh, PCs, but the other players yeah, at the table. That's where, I draw, trouble, that's where I draw the Causing line. trouble for you at the table, and they need to be taught a lesson that they're not the main fucking characters. All five of you, not the two of you, are the main characters. Exactly. So I got a question for you both. What's up? So what do you do when you have the opposite problem of, instead of main character syndrome, you have fucking NPC syndrome in your PCs? That is something that I have been struggling to deal with for two of my players. <laughs> Yeah. Recently, I mean, uh, yeah. you have to, at least what I've been trying to do. So a lot of people, they don't want, they are scared to be the main character. They don't want to step up. They think, oh, I'm not an yeah. actor. Oh, they're, I'm not. They're, they're scared to bite the bit. Yeah. They're scared to play the role that they chose to play. Mm. And that's yeah. fine. There's a lot of ways to deal with that, right? One of them, an extreme one, could just be to get them maybe to play a character that they're more comfortable with. Maybe if it comes to that, right? But there's a lot of things you can do before that to nudge them in the right direction which is feed them opportunities to do so, right? Give them, when failure isn't an option, the only option is to succeed, right? It comes down to a point where like, put them in situations where they're alone and they have to play the character. And if they really don't want to, then you know, you come to a situation where maybe they need to play a different one. Maybe they're just not a fit for your table and that's fine. Yeah. That doesn't mean you're a bad DM, doesn't mean they're necessarily a bad player. But maybe your guys' styles just don't work. Maybe they want to play more of a war game where they just do combat and they don't really want to role play. Right. At that point, I would just recommend Warhammer to somebody. Right. Right. I'm I always mean, out to talk about Warhammer. Because like at the end of the day, right, my party enjoys my games. I play a certain way. I, I DM. Is your biggest fucking ally to a situation where flexibility fucks you. Yeah. So quickly. Mm-hmm. No, like absolutely. If, I, if I'm playing Grognock the Destroyer, right, <laughs> and I'm over here trying to big brain some shit, I'm wrong, right? Mm. But if I'm DMing and the party's fighting Grognock the Destroyer and I'm not big braining some shit, I'm wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's night and day. I, I really long for more opportunities to be a player because what I've ran into is I'm making encounters and I'm making stories for a way of playing my favorite game that I don't know how to play, that I've never actually experienced the way that they are going to experience it. Right. And I think it hurts my storytelling. I... Yeah, it's it's such a strange transition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's an it's almost an unnatural transition. Yeah. Even with those even with those little metagame things, right? Like like for monsters for encounters. Everybody and their mother who's played D and D for any length of time knows what a troll is. Yep. They know how to kill a troll. You need fire. Mm. Fire is the only thing that actually leaves a troll dead or stops it from like you know doing its its healing regeneration. Yeah, it stops. Oh my it. I actually. But I actually as a as a crazy. player as a DM, I know I need to find fire. Mm. Does level four Joe Snuffy, who this is the first troll he's ever encountered, know that he needs fire? No, okay, then why am I relighting a torch right now on my first round of combat? So, yeah. So why I is my actually, action right now to light a torch? I don't... Joe Snuffy wouldn't know to light a torch. Yeah. Why am I lighting a torch right now? I'm, it, 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 <laughs> it's, it's, so, yeah. as a DM, one thing that I do is whenever players encounter a monster, oh, that's my in my head I'm thinking about how much is known about this monster, right? Mm. So, like, trolls, goblins, orcs, hobgoblins, right? These are sorts of things that I feel like the common folk would have a grasp on. They, they would understand these sorts of creatures because they're the sorts of things that they encounter. So I feel like it would be common knowledge for Joe Snuffy, right. you know, to, to know that, like, mm. hey, fire equals no more troll. Right. The thing is, though... Like, when it comes to something like, uh, oh, let me think for a second, like a banshee. Right. Right? <laughs> oh, fuck banshees, think, dude. Think about how many commoners realistically are escaping from banshees right. to talk about, like, how they did it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or, like, 
Uh, First of all, on a family you know save, you just die. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's insane. Like, how, how do you yeah. know? How does how does any random NPC know not to look a basilisk in the eyes? I don't think anyone would. Right. You, you'd have to find like some ancient fucking tome mm-hmm. on basilisks. Probably well, guess by- what? You're making a charism saver. You're turning to stone. Like, yeah, yeah, one thing that I like to do as a DM is I don't give the name of the creature. If yeah, it's just not the description. That mm-hmm. the party would know it. If, if they know what it is, then they know what it is. Mm-hmm. But like, shit like a basilisk, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think back to an encounter that I ran a long time ago. I think it was one of the first ones I ever ran with you, Dave. Um, and it was, uh, it was a stone serpent, right? Mm-hmm. It, it was a snake that looked like it was made out of stone, right? And it was a basilisk like it could turn you to stone and the party did actually just completely fuck it up but well but, yeah because i hear stone serpent and i'm like oh yeah i'm gonna bring a hammer and crack this thing like a porcelain plot uh and then david realizes way too late that he's looking a basculus dead in his shit and he's like oh my character has a negative three to charisma <laughs> <laughs> i'm fucked <laughs> that, yeah that, that's one of those ones where, where yeah. like i said earlier where, where the players go you son of a bitch that's amazing mm-hmm. but also fuck you yeah Right. And there's those golden times where the players look me dead in the eyes and say, you're crazy son of a bitch, that was amazing, but also fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I find that right balance, people. <laughs> and that, I, that, that, that balance that he's there, is, it comes with experience. Dude, it comes yeah. with knowing your yeah. players, knowing what your players want out of something. And that's why communication is also so important for a DM. It you took have me to talk to your players. eight years to write combat encounters <clears throat> where I'm not melting the party and the party's not melting my guys instantly. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's it's yeah. it's experience. You're you're going to make mistakes as a storyteller. Mm. No one's born William Shakespeare. That fucking nerd probably sat in his basement writing until he ran out of quills. And that's okay because we fucking yeah. love William Shakespeare. And you know what's crazy? Most of the fuck ups in your head as a DM, the party has no fucking idea that's not what was supposed to happen. They, they think it's not, awesome anyway. Yeah, they either don't know about it or it's their favorite part of the story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> like how like how every starting town in my in my campaigns are ochres. It took me so long to catch <laughs> on to that, but when I caught on to that, I was like, wait a fucking minute, I've been here before. <laughs> yeah, and they're all laid out like Riverwood from Skyrim. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you need help uh, we'll talking to world, uh, world building a little bit, mm-hmm. like designing dungeons. Pull a Skyrim. Yeah. Exactly. Make them go until there's a fucking crossway. Can't go one of the crossways. Go through the dungeon. Guess what? You come out the crossway and you're right next to the entrance. There's nothing wrong with simple level design. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with Everybody's that. worried about making things so <laughs> intricate well, you know and interesting, what? but you don't have to. Yeah, you, you really can don't. do other interesting things like and I, build an like incredible I said before. world. You don't have to know the trade routes between the elves and the dwarves. You can just have a town and yeah. a mystery in a town. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like I said before, I have Googled riddles for five-year-olds <laughs> and stumped 30-year-old-ass men for hours. Were they playing a barbarian? No. Oh, they, no. They just didn't understand that the riddle, the answer to the riddle was fire. And if you would have lit one of the torch sconches, the door would have opened. Right. And that comes into the See fun this? of, like, racial things and using, like, players' yeah. powers. Not against them, but to do interesting things most races in D and D, most of them have dark vision, mm. or you have magical light of some sort. Mm. Why do you need a light of torch when I can just read the writing on the walls? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, or another thing like that, right? Uh, so you walk into the room and you cannot see. Uh, I have dark vision. Well, that's crazy. It's a blinding fucking light. Um, you know what I mean? Like, if your players think they got you in a gotcha, gotcha them back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can breathe underwater. That's oil. Huh? <laughs> that's, that's oil, and uh, you see the uh, enemy wizard uh, conjuring a fireball. That's a pan shape. Good luck. Thing. You're that, submerged. That. You're submerged in liquid. Oh, it's fine. I can breathe water. You're having a lot of trouble breathing this. It's really thick. Yeah. It's really thick, and it smells like whale blubber. <laughs> Those candles look kind of loose. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> then the part is like, oh fuck, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, I think about like the couple times where I've had like the perfect kind of groups to fit with my DMing style. And like it is such a magical moment. But there's also something to be said for trying to find like that new style that your that your group is gonna fuck with when maybe oh, yeah. they don't fuck with like how you do things. Mm. Cause like my favorite way to play uh, D and D is super role play heavy. It's super story focused. Mm. Because like my scatterbrained ass can come up with 
a storyline for just about any character as long as the player takes them at least a little bit seriously. Right, and I I, I, I was struggling with his uh, DM style in the very beginning because it was like, oh, I've been DMing for so long, I just want to play a fighter and hit shit. Uh, and then combat wasn't really rolling around, and then my character naturally developed the idea of why do I carry this sword? Why do I wear the armor yeah, of my liege yeah. lord when I don't need to fight? Why does every time I fight, things get worse? Yeah. What am I if I am not a warrior? Mm-hmm. And then that, that goes into character building. Well, and then I right? think about like shit like the uh, like the Felucia arc in the Star Wars campaign. Oh my god, fucking money! That was terrifying. And I think about these those those little moments where like, um, oh my goodness! I, I, th- I think about the last session we ever played the Star Wars arc, and mm-hmm. I think about how like choked up um, one of our acquaintances got. I'm not going to call this man out. Right. Right. Because no, no, no one wants to I admit think... that they were crying fully because we were pretending to be Star Wars characters and rolling dice. You know what I mean? You know, you think about like there's there's this moment with like the emotional storytelling that like I live for as a DM, you know. And then like every time I've tried to transition to a player, it's usually just normal ass D and D. Yeah. And, and and there's not that the huge fucking emphasis on storytelling like I give. And I feel like it's it's probably pretty selfish of me to want to like experience the kind of stories that I tell. Uh, yeah, well, we, I mean, we fall into that, right? We get used to that. But the the idea that like you get those intrusive thoughts of, well, that's not how I would have done that. Oh yeah. But the the thing is, is you're not the DM. You are Brimble McGrimble, the fighter. Yeah. Why does he care about the intricacies of this combat encounter? You're getting your shit pushed in. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Uh yeah. So do you guys think that when you're when you're running an encounter that you don't intend the party to win? That you you know like an encounter of like hey, uh, like like let's say that the party is like level three and like they're traversing this great desert, right? And a purple worm shows the fuck up. And me as a DM, I'm thinking, okay, I need them to run, right? Mm-hmm. This needs to be like the worm is chasing them. This is the encounter that I've thought up, mm. right? And they're like, we're gonna stand and fight. As a DM, do you guys think that it's appropriate to tell them, hey, you guys don't have this fight? No. No, but there are ways to do that, right? Yeah. It's a purple worm, right? It doesn't have that kind of intelligence, but what it is is a hunter. Mm-hmm. And if it wants to fight, and the party starts landing some hits, to the purple worm, is this prey worth the catch if I'm getting hurt in it? Just make mm-hmm. the purple worm go away. Or, at the same time... Right? And then maybe you can, like, as they're traversing, do some tremors in the ground. Yeah. Have it pop back up again and then go away. Okay. Try to poke out weak points, right? Okay. This thing is a—it's a hunter. Yeah. It's, it's looking for food. Is this food worth getting hurt for as an animal? Yeah. You know what I mean. At the same time, uh, taking this specific encounter in, right? There is nothing wrong, right? There is nothing fucking wrong with that party not being able to hurt that purple worm, and then they get eaten, right? Because at the same time, right, if I roll up on a grizzly bear and I'm unarmed and I think to myself, I'm going to punch that grizzly bear in his fucking mouth. David, I think you as a human have that, but most people don't. Yes, but I also understand that if I get mauled, that's on me. Mm -hmm. If your party is fucking crazy enough for them to look a gargantuan sized worm that spits acid in the mouth and be like, yeah, my normal iron longsword can kill that thing. Fuck around and find out sometimes. Yeah. But show them that it's not a good fight. Before you start right? killing people. Maybe when that purple worm comes up, it coughs a dragon skull out. Okay. Show them then and there that this is probably not a good idea, but I'm not going to stop you from doing it. Yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's going to be really funny. It just occurred to me that like your audience is going to think that some rando just fucking showed up and started... That's been happening so many times. Uh, this is uh, this is this is Womack. This is uh, one of my friends. Big Wizzy! Uh, yeah. We, fifth surprise guest of the night, I think, at this point. But uh, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, really, it's really that simple, right? Show them the stakes. Hmm. And at the end of the day, you can't stop them from stepping on that landmine. You can show them big flashing signs that say, do not walk through minefield. Yeah. If they want to kick flip through it, good luck on your yeah. dex check, bro. And, well, and you know my DM style. Like, I, I try to weave character death into the narration. Mm. That might be something that I should relax on. 
So, right, at the end of the day, if that party fights the purple worm, and the fighter gets swallowed instantly, the rest of the party immediately thinks, oh, fuck me, we're not ready. Let the rest of the party get away, and let them have a reminder that there's something in those sands we're not ready for yet. Yeah. But we'll come back to avenge our friend anyway. Oh, yeah. When we're stronger. Yeah. Right, that's, that's like one of my favorite stories of me as a player. I had in my backstory that my village was raised by Tarak. It was raised, not like grown, but like raised, destroyed, raised. Yeah, like uh, fucking Wade Lake yeah, too. by Tarask. Yeah. My character is fearful of Tarasks. We were level 15. And we see a Tarask crest the mountains. My character pulls out his revolver, loads it, spins the chamber, cocks it back, and the party says, what are we going to do against that thing? He said, nothing, just like my father was able to, and then shot himself in front of the party. <laughs> Me about that's a big uh oh. That's a big uh oh moment. That's a that's, that's a, a moment that showed in the party that oh we do not have that fucking fight. Yeah. If our grizzly gunslinger who I've seen shoot devils in the face looked at that thing and then took his own life, holy yeah. fuck, we're not ready. A grizzly right. instant death. A grisly instant death is where we just left off. Yeah, we had so, a, a handful of interruptions and some more friends come by CQ. Sorry, we're do, we are doing this in public for our first time. That's why we had a, a bunch of uh, surprise guests, as it were. Yeah, as, as I was saying, a grisly instant death is sometimes the bucket of cold water in the face that the party needs to remind you know, themselves, right? Moving back to a prior point, that there are consequences in this world. Sometimes it's not even the party's actions whose consequences they sow. Right? The reason that that Tarask was brought to life was because instead of chasing after the person who's trying to summon them, we got hiccups, sorry. We got wrapped up in this side quest uh, about this um, like dwarven woman who was uh, trying to get out of a um, like contract uh, at a brothel. She was like the, the singer slash show woman, and we fell in love with her because it was a, a funny little NPC, real Boblin the Goblin moment. Uh, and instead of chasing down the big bad evil guy who's trying to bring Tarasks into this world, we helped her uh, find a way to break her contract without breaking her contract. Tarasks were summoned, character dead. Uh, as a player, don't be afraid to where if you see your party kind of getting too big for their britches or not big enough for their britches do something drastic if it makes sense with your character in that gunslinger's mind there was nothing that could be done with this situation and knowing that Tarasks can take days to digest you he chose the easy way out a grizzly uh, a grizzly example however it punctuated a fear into that party that made the Tarask fight later in the campaign heavy, in a good way. Hmm. Did you did you pick up and play another character after that in the same campaign? No. Huh. That uh, so we were running multiple campaigns at the time, and I was like, I don't want the party to think that, you know, the idea of actions have consequences, and like I, I, it was hard for me to balance two games at once. I was like, oh, I'll just opt out of that game. Hmm. Funny coincidence that we ran into the Tarask and the party. Not only being down their gunslinger, but being down their sixth party member in total, added some pressure to that campaign. Nothing wrong with that at all. I don't know, and it was fun too. The reaction on everyone's faces at the table was hilarious. You know me when I get a genuine reaction, player or especially DM, like a genuine emotion, like genuine shock, mm -hmm. genuine excitement, or like I feel really bad saying it, but the times I've made people cry at the table. Not because I'm being mean to them, but because, like, the story got that real. Beautiful to me. That's great. That's good storytelling. Yeah. And that comes down to you guys as players. You guys get into, you guys get super into character. You guys... That shit affects you, and I feel bad about it afterwards. But in the moment, it's like, oh, yeah, they're, they're feeling this. This is, this is a... You have made Callan full ugly cry multiple times at the table. I love Callan. Like a sister. And we also need to get her on the podcast. It is not hard to make her cry. She, this is fair. <laughs> I feel bad because, like, it, and, and it's funny because she knows. Mm -hmm. Like, if she senses that there's a, like like a, a, an emotional moment coming, I'll see her like reach for tissues preemptively, and I'm like, I, I, have I traumatized this woman? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, sis. Love you. 
but yeah, you're right. This is gonna suck. Like, <laughs> this is gonna be a, a hard one to justify making my friend cry again. Mm. But I'm gonna. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you all who have stayed this long for listening to us ramble about Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know how inf- how useful this information will be to you, but um, God damn it, we had to talk about it for help. Um, almost an hour and a half. Almost an hour and a half. Yeah. And there were a lot of rambles or a lot of side conversations, but I think we got the point across. I think we got a couple good points across. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. A couple banger lines in there. Absolutely. To wrap everything back up to touch on our key bullet points, the power of improv is your friend as a player and a DM. Mm-hmm. As a DM, it is the player's story. You're just telling it. Actions have consequences. Keep things heavy but fun. What, what, what else? What, what else was a big bullet point you think we covered? Uh, those are those are the big bits. I think. I think those are all the big bits. Yeah. Thank you all very much for sitting here throughout all of this. Uh, this has been the first episode of the Two Dudes, One Barracks podcast. I love you all. I thank you all very much for stopping by. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye. Bye-bye.